Hey guys, my name is Joe Michael, driving along with my co-pilot Georgia. You're watching TJV and Diesel the Weasel. Don't forget to subscribe. Hey everybody, today's video is more of just an update. I didn't really film much today. I was at home today. We got home last night and I got to spend the night and most of today, or all of today at home with Britt. And uh, now I'm back here at work, hooked back onto my trailer and I'm gonna bring this out to South Central Manitoba for the morning. I've got my next load sitting here right beside me. Uh, tomorrow I can go home for the night yet and then Tuesday morning, which is the day after tomorrow, I come back and I hook onto this new trailer here and we're pulling this all the way down to Indiana and Kentucky. There she was. We're taking farm equipment, headers. One of these is going down to Indiana. I believe Princeton, Indiana, and the other one's going down to somewhere in Kentucky. Indiana and Kentucky, or Indiana and Kentucky. One of them, one of them. That's, that's what's going on here. So, looking forward to that next week. Well, we're not going very far. We only have like another hour and a half to drive from Winnipeg here. But I'm still gonna get a coffee anyway because I've been craving one all day. I haven't had my coffee this afternoon. I've been saving it, waiting to get here. <laughs> we the Flying J in uh, West Winnipeg and Headingley. Go and get our bean to cup coffee. And then I'll still have lots of energy when I stop. I don't have a problem falling asleep after having coffee this late at night. But once I stop, I'm in the middle of a good book right now anyway, so I'll read a couple of chapters, and that puts me to sleep. If I can't fall asleep, simple. Just, just read a book. It puts me to sleep. I like reading. I just It takes me forever to get through a book because I always fall asleep. This guy parked in front of the pumps, but he left his trailer in the pumps. That's not how you do it, buddy. <laughs> Gotta get out of the pumps and clear the pumps so that people can fuel up behind you. That's the whole kind of thing. Look at that ball of fire in the sky. It's way too low in the sky to do anything. Look at all this. It's the sun way down there in the south. We're facing south right now. Head southwest toward Tower Line Road and turn left onto Tower Line Road. We're just leaving the co-op where we spent the night and we're about to go deliver this load to that trust company in uh, South Central Manitoba, near Carberry, Manitoba. All right, let's go deliver some stuff. I've got three tarps on this load I'm gonna have to load up, uh, pardon me, roll up. And it's only minus 10 or minus 15, somewhere in there. I'll have to wait till my truck gives me a little bit more of an accurate reading once we get moving, because when you're sitting, it really doesn't give you an accurate reading at all. It just gets all the heat off the motor and tells you that it's actually <clears throat> that it's warmer than it actually is. Great road. This is where we're turning, apparently. That's a gravel road. I'm glad I didn't wash my truck. These are how the majority of roads are in Manitoba. Great road for three kilometers. The main roads are all paved, obviously, but all the grid roads between farms, because farms are all split up into quarters, right? A quarter mile. Each farm gets a quarter mile, or each field is a quarter mile. Each farmer's got varying quarters. But uh, and there's gravel roads in grid patterns that go around the square mile. And inside the square mile, there's four properties. Sometimes the farmer owns all four, sometimes it's split between four, sometimes they split them in half, and there's eight people that own it. But there's a road every square mile here. That's just how they uh, they divvied up the land when they settled it. And all these roads are gravel. I call them grid roads or back roads, farm roads. That way everybody got a nice big quarter section of land to, to farm and everybody had access to the road because there's no rivers here, right? Back in the day they needed rivers to transport their goods to market. Now that we have vehicles, they can just use trucks, but trucks need to be able to access the farm. That was what they did. They did the same thing in the United States. Look at a Google Maps picture or Google Earth and zoom into like Iowa 
and you'll see the same thing. The whole state is just a grid pattern of these grid roads, every square mile. It's pretty neat to see from above. Go check it out if you have time. It's amazing how they've developed that entire state. And it goes like that all the way through North Dakota, right up to Canada, right up to the top of the prairies here in uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta. And they're pretty solid roads. Like, they are all-season roads, so you can drive on them four seasons. In springtime, you got to be careful because some of them, the ones that aren't traveled as much, sometimes they get a little bit soft. But... Usually they have signs up to say not in all weather road then. Normal Manitoba roads. Get on them and give them. 600 meters, turn right onto road 63 north. Actually, uh, you shouldn't just get on these roads and give her. There are speed limits on these roads. Uh, I believe if it's not posted, the speed limit on a back road like this is 90 kilometers an hour or like 55 miles an hour. And when you come up to intersections like this one here, up, up in front of us, there are no stop signs for any direction. No stop signs. So the way it works is whoever is on the right has the right of way. So if there was someone coming here from the right, I would have to stop if I was going straight and let them do whatever they're doing because they have the right of way. Oh, they actually have a stop sign here, pardon me. A lot of these intersections don't have stop signs. And then, uh, yeah, just remember that, because, uh... Continue on Road 63 North for two kilometers. Otherwise, you'll have, uh... Oh, boy, slippery, slippery, slippery. Yikes. There we go. Otherwise, you'll have uh, a bit of an accident, or actually a, quite a big accident. <laughs> All right, let's get onto this uh, get onto this property here, wherever it's supposed to be, just ahead here, I think. We'll unload this and rush home. I have a doctor's appointment today at 4.30 in Steinbach, so I don't want to miss that. It's very important to me. I want it, to, we're going over the results of my blood test and my CT scan recently. And I'm hoping he's going to say, you know what, this discomfort you're feeling in your back is probably just either your spine or... Or what I'm really hoping he's gonna say is probably just your muscles. Like, go see a masseuse, go, go get a massage or something. I'm trying to rule out the worst case scenario first and work our way down from there. Again. That's a long story, but I'm dealing with some, some stuff. I wouldn't call it health issues because I feel fine. Don't worry about me. I feel fine, but it's something that I, uh, I just have to get checked out. <laughs> further yet. Oh, it's down at the end of this. About another, okay, another two miles yet. Yeah, okay. This colony is fascinating. It's just like an Amish colony, but it's a Hutterite colony, and they use machinery. Brand new machinery. Everything here is tip-top. Everything is organized perfectly, lined up precisely in their yard. Everything is clean. Everything is in good working order it's just wow they take care of their stuff here and it's so interesting because there's like a like a little town and stuff all over here right like they got their living quarters here they all live here together they got the school over here a play play yard for the kids they got the warehouse here where everybody works and they got a couple more on the other side on the colony over there where everyone works as well and uh, they're totally self-sustaining. They got a whole bunch of uh, fields around here. They own tons and tons of land around here, so they farm their own fields. They got their own little society going on here. I've known Hutterites before. I'm, I have a Mennonite background. Those of you who've been watching a while, you know that. Very similar, Mennonites and Hutterites. Uh, we sort of went our own ways, but Amish. We're, we're the same bloodline, same, we're like cousins with the Amish. There's like the Mennonites up here, and then there's the Hutterites, and then there's the Amish. And the Amish is sort of like our extremists. You don't really gotta worry too much about our extremists, we're fine. We're just a bunch of pacifists. Just leave us alone, right? We just wanna do our own thing over here. Go to church, make some money, raise our families in peace. That's all we want. So Mennonites, Hutterites, Amish, very similar. Uh, it goes, in my mind, it goes in that order. Like, 
obviously this is just my my view of it but you know the Amish they don't use any electricity they use horse and buggy uh, Hutterites they use equipment but they're still more segregated than the Mennonites whereas the Mennonites were sort of uh, more assimilated right into mainstream Canadian societies more so not completely I mean Steinbeck still has the more the most churches per capita of any city in Canada but when you come into the city, you won't feel like you're on a colony. You won't feel like you're on a Mennonite colony. There's people of other nationalities that live among us as well, whereas in Hutterite colonies, it's just them that live here, right? And Amish is pretty much the, it's the same thing, whereas Mennonites were sort of a little bit, like, it's a little bit more mixed up. You won't be able to notice it when you come into town. Unless if you know the history of Steinbeck and you know the history of Southern Manitoba, that's just how that is. So it's interesting seeing this is how like my family lines used to live. Secluded from the rest of society, having their own little thing going on. But they were always very successful, just like the Hutterites. Very hard workers, very successful. They always uh, they always profited, you know. Maybe they got a point here, maybe they got something going on here, you know? And they're all very happy. Very happy people, very friendly people. They actually let me park inside their their big shop here. They wanted me to untarp out here and unstrap out here at first, and then I asked them nice and went, "Would you mind if I would, you know, if I, could I do it inside, please?" And they said, "Oh yeah, 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 no problem. Yeah, no kidding. I should have offered that for you. Yeah, you go inside. You do it inside. It's cold out here." So they let me roll up my tarps inside, unstrap inside. I got to look. I'm in a t-shirt instead of working out here in the freezing cold. Very nice people, so five star review. Anyways, let's go home. Uh, I got the doctor's appointment, it's just before noon right now. I should be able to get home first and then go to my doctor's appointment after I shower. I'd like to shower first, you, know, you never want to go to the doctor without showering, you never, especially when you don't know if you're getting, like, uh, you just don't want to stink when you go out in public. Well, I filled my tanks up with some good old Canadian fuel. We know that Canadian fuel works better in Canada in the winter time. I could have waited, I guess, because uh, we're going south, right? So we're going to be going down, all the way down to Kentucky and Tennessee. You don't want that fuel that you fuel up with in Kentucky and Tennessee in your tanks when you get back up here to the cold. If it is, sometimes it's just, you know you don't really have much of a choice. Always make sure to put that, uh, I use Power Service Anti-Gel, the white jug. I buy the big jug and I put half of it in each tank. When temperatures are below minus 25 Celsius. Around minus 20 I even throw it in there, so if I got fuel in my tanks from down south. Up here in Canada I only use it if the temperature goes down below minus 20. And you don't really need it as badly because the fuel up here is conditioned already for winter, but you still, you don't want to freeze up. You want to make sure that that diesel fuel remains liquid in your tanks and not jello. Because that's what it'll do. Gasoline doesn't do that the same. 200 meters, turn right on, Portage Avenue, Highway 1. We've got to make sure on the way back up that we're careful where we refuel. Cause it's probably gonna be pretty cold. We got a pretty warm day here. We got lucky. I got home right in sort of like a little warm spell for January. But last week while we were gone, it was negative 20 degrees and negative 30 one night. And I'm guessing for the rest of January and February, it's gonna be around minus 30 to minus 40 plus the wind chill, which could get down to minus 65. Always look ahead. Look at the temperatures before you come up here. And we got a diesel. And we got a Chevy. Nice kiss. I didn't know you wanted to kiss everybody. This is my cotton-headed ninny muggins. Man, he doesn't got much cotton left in him anymore, though, does he? Does he? No, he took them all out. He needed an operation. I had to remove a squeaky device. It's true. He did. What else we got around here? I have a feeling we got someone else around here. There's a Vino. There's a little Vino Wolfen. Little Vino Wolfen, don't be shy. <laughs> He's all sad right now because Britt just left for work. And I gotta leave for work right now too. Does that make you sad too? No, not really. You can go. I just miss mommy. <laughs> I got one more around here somewhere. Somewhere around here, laying around here. 
We've got a foster boy of sorts around here. How are you doing, Big Frank? Just checking in, checking in with everybody. Such a good boy. He has uh, made himself very at home here. Just part of the pack already. Such a good boy. And uh, it's a winter wonderland outside, everybody. Getting a good snowfall today. It's actually slowed down quite a bit. Good, 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 good. Because in tomorrow's vlog, uh, today for me, I've got to go and chain down some firm equipment. Take that firm equipment all the way down to Indiana and Kentucky. And we have a load that's waiting for us in Tennessee. It's ready already, so i got to get there as soon as I can. So it'll take two days to get down to Indiana and Kentucky. We'll unload those day after tomorrow. And then we go pick up our load, preloaded trailer in Tennessee, and that's taking us up to Alberta, I believe. And it's supposed to be like minus 40 when we get there to Alberta. So let's just look at this winter wonderland from the warmth of home. Oh, some bald eagles flying around back there. Look at that. What's up, America? Got some America flying, flying around. Got some freedom flying around back there somewhere. I saw it right over there. A couple of bald eagles. Oh, oh, there he is, there he is. Do you see him? These things are huge. Huge. Huge freedom birds. Yeah, this is our backyard. It was coming down pretty good before. Now it's just lightly snowing, which is good because I didn't really want to be outside tying down and chaining down in the in the snowstorm. So we better get going. I want to get out of this weather before it gets worse. Let's go south. Let's get away from this winter thing that they got going on up here in Canada. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Don't forget to like and subscribe. We make new videos pretty much every day. And we're going to go visit America. So hey, if you like America, tune in tomorrow. Subscribe. Have I told you that already? Subscribe. That way you won't miss it. Hit the bell and we'll see you tomorrow.